Well, that's actually a really great introduction because I know YY's got some things that she'll be talking about relative to that, that whole area. Um, but her background, just so you know, is she's currently the COO of First Rain. Um, she's also a startup founder and has experienced the from the ground up stage bootstrapping, which I know several of you in this room could probably relate to. Um, she's had worked through various forms of financing uh, as well as an acquisition. Um, she's been part of building startups, running divisions of large public companies, which is very different, uh, as well as uh, leading the acquisition and integration of startups, which is also very different. Um, but as the CEO, she's been the technical and product executive leading the development uh, of the company from its early stage technology roots into its uh, current phase as a high growth SaaS enterprise. And she's got a large roster of uh, Fortune 500 and Global 1000 customers, which is pretty impressive. So, great. There Thank, you. Thank you. No, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you. So, um, just two minutes about me, and then I'd love to spend a few minutes on you, and then we can talk about the yeah, the real story and the real strategies about building startup. Yeah, not the stuff they write in blogs, right? We can talk about the real. How do you actually build a startup team in Silicon Valley when you know Facebook is paying ten-year-olds two hundred thousand dollars a year? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody trying to hire in that environment? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, as Beth said, uh, I have done uh, a variety of phases of companies, and not by design, but my career has actually been alternating between startups and large public companies. So I have, in my late 20s, I started a company from my apartment. Now, you know, back then, that was like really precocious. Now everybody's like, well, why did you wait so long? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, and the reason I started back then was because I really was, I have a technical background, so I have a math degree. I worked at Bell Labs early on. I've done software, I've done hardware, I've run software teams, I've been a product person. But I was really fascinated by the mechanics of how companies work and just that exchange of value, like that creates value, right? A well-run company creates value. And so I'll tell you, the reason that I started my first company in my late 20s was because I had read the statistics that eight out of 10 startups fail. So I thought, I better start getting going and get those first eight out of the way really fast. <laughs> but um, luckily that company was actually quite successful. It was acquired by a public company. And so, you know, I've done that, I've worked at startups, I've been part of the technical team at startups, I've been part of the management team. Um, in between, I ran a $170 million division of a billion dollar public company with a, you know, a worldwide um, technical team. And now I'm at First Rain, and we are basically, um, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a restart. We're a company that, uh, was started um, by some really smart, like MIT, Princeton, CS, PhD kids who built a pile of like amazing technology, got people to give them tens of millions of dollars, and then their investors started getting a little impatient, like this all looks really great, you know, where's the business around this? And um, after a few years, uh, my CEO, who's Penny Hersher, who's actually supposed to talk today, and hopefully we'll come back and talk with you uh, soon, um, and uh, she was talking to looking at the company, that eventually running the company. She talked me into it, and we kind of took the technology. And what we do is, let me just tell you a little bit about the technology first, right? Just so you have my technical product perspective, which is we have um, semantic analytic software uh, software engines, and what we do is we are constantly reading all of the information that is written on the global web and in social media. And from that, we actually derive a structural model of what companies are doing and what's happening between companies. So our premise is companies are not out there trying to tell you about themselves, but there is all this digital exhaust about them. You know, not the stuff that mentions the company, you know, like the press release from Apple, right? <laughs> but the stuff that is like written by their employees, written by their competitors, the stuff that doesn't even mention to the companies, the stuff that is written by academic institutions that are doing research in the area that is the main line of business that's gonna be the revenue generator for the company, right? If you can actually have machines read all of this stuff and understand it and then connect the dots, 
you actually get like an MRI machine where you can look through companies and actually see what's happening within a company and between companies and industries. So that's the business that we're in. We've built this business analytics system which is able to slice through all of this information, build real-time structural models of what's happening to companies. And we sell it in a business-to-business -business model to large global uh, Fortune you know, 100, uh, Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 companies. So that's the business that we're in. So, um, and you know, this company has gone from really kind of just pulling the business together out of the technology pieces to we are really in a very um, high growth stage uh, which is yet another startup stage, right? It's, it's a stage that uh, maybe some of you are in, maybe some of you will hit. So I'm just interested in the people in this room. Um, how many of you are in the very early stages of a startup, you know, less than three people involved? Most people. Okay. Um, funded, not funded, not yet funded. Bootstrapping. Most people are bootstrapping. Okay, great. Uh, have, you put up, have you put together your founding teams? How many people are still putting together their founding teams and their core teams? Great. How many people have a founding team and a core product team already running? Besides us. Yes. <laughs> great, exactly, exactly. Great, so this is a very early stage group which is very um, appropriate for the startup lab. So I'll talk a little bit about that because you know, the thing I want to talk about was about building the winning lineup. So if you read the blogs, right, if you, you know, about building your leadership team, you know, you, you get a lot of like rah, rah, rah. And I was just reading a blog the other day. It was like, oh my gosh, in your startup, you know, here's 17 functions you must have. You must have fantastic business development. You have to have a technical visionary. You better have a UX specialist today. And you better have a mobile architect. You better have a social media specialist. And man, you're off to the races and boy, who could argue with that, right? Everybody wants that winning, winning lineup because you, know, you want all these people doing work on your idea because your idea is fantastic. It's gonna take a lot of work, right? But this is what the reality of actually sometimes building the winning leadership really, team really feels like. Having started a company from my apartment, I think I've had that exact moment myself where I'm like with my ramen. Uh, ramen. I've got my bowl of instant ramen. <laughs> oh my gosh. Am I supposed to like am I coding right now? Am I selling stuff? <laughs> right? And so, you know, the, the real art is how do you build a winning leadership team? How do you build a team that is going to turn your idea from an idea to reality? It's going to do the work, the important pieces of the work given the trade-offs, the constraints, and it is all about managing constraints. It's not all about knowing which talent you want to get. Everybody knows which talents we want to get. The question is, how do we do that? How do we accomplish that given the constraints? And that absolutely applies at the very, very early stages, which I've you know, personally experienced, but it also applies when you get to the, the build-out stage, you know, the, um, when you're, you're developing your first management team, and even, you know, we're in our high growth stage right now, and we still think about a lot about how do we balance and build out this winning leadership team. So this is a little bit of what I wanted to talk to you about, about what I've seen that's worked, what I've tried that's worked, what I've tried that hasn't worked as well, some things that surprised me along the way, mm -hmm. some ways by hook or by crook that I actually got capacity, right? And so I don't have to tell you guys about this, but founders, are constantly trying to balance capacity, expertise, and experience. And you will never have enough of all of these, right? And sometimes you try to supply all of these things yourself. And it is actually um, very hard to get these. And, and what you want is a little bit of a distribution of resource. And some of that can come from yourself. Some of that can come from people that you recruit to join your effort. And some of that, you may get by extending your team in other ways, right? But capacity, just the sheer amount of stuff that goes on. I've got to say that um, it's not really talked about that much because we have in Silicon Valley such a glorified uh, culture of the startup, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, and then this person, usually a guy, he was in his dorm room writing some code and then all of a sudden, you know, there's this, but, I, the, the thing that I remember about capacity 
was waking up every day and realizing the company does not make any progress unless I do something. Like the company, does, and that to me, having been in big companies, having been the boss, having been part of teams, having started something from the ground up, that to me was the, the absolute kind of, that, that was, that's what makes founders really special, is that you wake up and your company doesn't, nothing happens unless you do something, right? And so there's capacity, like you have to supply a lot of that capacity. And along the way, what you're trying to do is to increase that capacity so that maybe there's some other people, maybe there's some other ways that the company can make progress. You know, there's expertise. We all bring certain expertise to bear, but we probably don't have every piece of the equation. So maybe you're a business founder and you need some technical, right? Maybe you're a technical founder and you need some relationships. Even if you have everything, sometimes it's actually hard to play both roles, right? Even if I, I've actually played the business role and I've played the technical role, but I find it incredibly hard to play both at the same time. And in fact, in my current job, I've, I've actually managed, I'm the, my, my title has been the same the whole time, VP of Operations, COO, but I've actually traded off roles because there were times when I said, you know what, I can't manage the development of the technology and also represent the product externally because I know too much about where all the bones are buried. Right? So sometimes even if you have all of the skills, you actually need to separate it because that creative tension of expertise, you know, of somebody who's trying to position something to the market versus something, somebody who's trying to make it, make, it, um, make it real, right? And then there's experience, right? There's, you know, do you have the people that have done it before? Do you have the people that represent the market that you are going to sell into, right? Do you have natives in the market that you're, that you're going into? And I love seeing women working at, you know, startups, starting more companies, because women are more than 50% of the population. Women make more than 50% of the buying decisions. And so women uniquely have the experience to connect with 50% of the decision makers, whether it's consumer decision makers, business decision makers, et cetera. Um, but these are the kinds of things that you know, we're always constantly trying to balance. And so uh, one of the things that I will talk about then is just you know, things that I've seen um, about getting to critical mass. And but like I said, there's a lot that's said and written about getting to critical mass. There's less said about the by hook or by crook part, because that's how you have to do it. You know, there is no pretty way of getting there. You cannot cover all of the bases, so it really is by hook or by crook. And there's going to be your core team. Now, who's actually on deck working long-term committed to your team? It could be you. It could be you and a handful of people. It could be, you know, if you're lucky enough to have, to get to the point where you're building out a team. And then there's the question of what can you do to put more hands on deck so that you can round out all of those three areas that you need to go, right? So let's talk about the core team. Well, the first thing is, in terms of your core team, the people who are in your company, your co-founders, your founding team, your founding team, there is no by hook or by crook. So that's where I cross out. Do not do the core team by hook or by crook, right? Um, and this is a little bit motherhood on apple pie, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But I would say that the most important thing that you can have in your core team is trust. And why do you want trust? It's not because of like all of the paranoia of like, oh, you know, founder wars and options and you know, changing the, it's not because of that. It's because you have so much work to be done. You have seven times as much work to be done as you have resources. And trust is insanely efficient. When you trust people, you don't have to spend time checking in. You don't have to spend time negotiating. You don't have to spend time getting people. You can go and you can get two, three times more stuff done. Trust, the reason that you want trust is because you have to get so much done and trust is incredibly, incredibly efficient. So I would say that that is the most important ingredient of your core team. Just to give you an example, at first rain, um, I'm very lucky, Penny Hersher and I, Penny is the CEO, this happens to be the third time we've worked together. Okay, we've also done lots of things that are apart from each other. Hopefully you'll meet her sometime. We are incredibly different. We're like total, she's 
tall, blonde, British, charming. <laughs> I'm nerdy, introverted, love code. Uh, <laughs> um, but we have incredible trust. And we don't always get along. We're very, very different. But we have incredible trust. And the reason that works is because in a startup, because you are over-constrained, by definition you are over-constrained, so you will be trying to solve impossible things. You will be trying to solve situations which have no good solution. If you have trust with the other people in your core team, whether they're co-founders, whether they're employees, or whatever, you have to trust them to make the best of those over-constrained situations, right? Then you, know, you, then you run. The other thing is, of course, excellence. You know, everybody talks about excellence, but what does excellence mean to me? There, and there's a lot of, you know, we live in Silicon Valley. We're so lucky. There's, there's, this is like a magnet for excellence. There's so many excellent people around. There's so many people that I meet throughout, you know, every week and every month. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to start a company just so I can do it with you. But what excellence means is that when you think about what you're trying to do, when you think about your idea, your business, the thing that you're trying to make real, you cannot think of a better group of people to do this with. I could not think of a better group of people to do this with. You cannot compromise on excellence. And it, it, you have to be very, very picky because excellence will help you gain trust, but also when you go to do business with other companies. Yeah, everybody's fixated on fundraising. Absolutely, the VCs will smell whether you feel this or not, but, when you, but more important than the VCs are your customers. If you are doing business with your customers, they are, you know, you are going to be, you're going to be asking people to entrust a financial transaction, a business transaction, a consumer transaction to you, and you're going to be unknown, right? First rain, we are being, we're very successful now, but we're still not a brand name. You know, you've probably never heard of us. We do business with companies like GE, Intel, Pfizer, Dun and Bradstreet. We do six and seven figure annual deals with these companies. And because they have to look at us and they have to trust us with that transaction. Excellence, because you are the underdog. You need excellence. And then alignment. That is the other thing, is that you need alignment, not just you know, alignment around vision, but personal alignment, right? Is your, is your business gonna need, um, is gonna need funding, right? Is this person gonna be able to put money in if you need to put money in? Are you okay if they don't, right? Uh, in my company today, I have a big R&D team, an incredible R&D center in India. And the way that we've structured it, we actually run twice as fast because we can do work in the U.S., hand off to India, they do work. We work hand in hand. It's not like an outsource model. They are like, you know, they're our partners. And done right, you run twice as fast. Done wrong, you run twice as slow. But what that means is that everybody who joins my team in leadership capacity has to be prepared to work on a global team. You have to be willing to take morning calls. You have to be willing to take evening calls. You have to be willing to talk to people on Skype with a very different and hard to understand uh, uh, you know, accent. And by the way, they think we're very difficult to understand too. They think we're really, really difficult to understand because we have these terrible accents, right? But that is alignment. I test for that. I test for that. Because even if somebody is excellent, even if they have all the chops, even if they have all the pedigree, if they're not in a place where they can tolerate that, if they're not in a place where they can wrap their heads around that, it's not going to work. And then finally, just sheer bloody mindedness. You have to remember that you are going to be doing reality distortion with this group of people. There is something that does not exist. And by the end, by the time you're done, it will exist, right? So it's got to be a group of people that you think, wow, this is a group of people that I can make magic with, that I am going to create something from nothing. And so really, your core team is your key. Um, I can't tell you enough to spend time, meet people, get to know people, work together, and get true alignment. And trust. Trust is really efficient. A lot of people in startups, they talk about trust because they talk about the paranoia side, right? Don't get screwed. This is, these are things that co-founders have to do to protect themselves. It's not about that. It's about getting a huge amount of work done and having it be a pleasure. Having it be a pleasure. That's what trust is about. So you got your great core team, but man, you still have five times as much stuff to do that you need to do. So what are some of the ways that I've seen and that I have myself uh, put together the critical mass? And this is by hook or by crook. And the great thing is, again, we are in Silicon Valley. There is a tremendous amount of talent 
There is energy. There are people. They are energized by this kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, each of these types of types of um, resources. Advisors. Advisors can be an incredibly powerful resource, especially with something like the Women's Startup Lab. You're going to meet a lineup of people, most of whom are going to be incredibly impressive. They could help you. They have tremendous connections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my gosh, start an advisory board, get these people. Well, here's the key to actually getting juice out of advisors. That, and I have really learned this by trial and error, is that it's actually all about, it's, it's not about how impressive they are. It's all about how much capacity you have to put in work to actually set up a situation that's nutritious for them to affect your business in some way. And that takes a lot of work. And so you have to evaluate in your own team, in yourself, how much time, how much energy do you have to package up things so that advisors can actually work on it. Because you have to think that advisors are thinking about your company maybe once every three months. They're thinking about all these other things. The good ones, when you get to the point where you have a board, we have an amazing board at First Rain, and that is a testament to our CEO. Uh, Penny, who has just put together an incredible board. Our board adds so much value, so much value. And I can tell you the best advisors that we have on our board and, and otherwise are people who are incredibly expert at one thing. So they are just totally world-class experts at one thing, but also they have seen hundreds, dozens or hundreds of companies that are in our situation in our stage. Okay, so. The way that the advisors are useful are not because like they can tell you how to do something. You might get a marketing advisor. It's not like they're going to be like, oh, you know, here's the right marketing campaign for you. It's because they've seen so many companies in your stage is that they can immediately recognize when you're about to trip through certain different circumstances, right? So we have one person on our board, and he built a billion-dollar company. He is. Um, he just sits on boards. He's a, he's a really, really uh, well-known executive. And he is like a genius at sales models. It's amazing. So we, you know, we'll have a board meeting. We'll show him our p and It's this dry spreadsheet, right? He'll take off his glasses and he'll like stare down at his iPad. And then he'll point to one number and he'll say, you know what? This ratio, the ratio of this number to this number means that this productivity metric of your sales team is a warning sign. This is something you need to watch out for. And the reason he can do that is like, I'm like, oh my gosh, the guy has total x-ray vision through PLs. No, the reason he's done that is because he has read PLs every week through hundreds of companies. He knows when companies are going to be at risk, right? It's just like my, my wife is um, a high school teacher. Well, my wife actually started a high school. So talk about a hard startup to start. She actually started a high school for very, very underserved kids in San Francisco that actually sends almost all of them to college. But, so, so, but, but she's a high school teacher, and she can walk into a classroom, and like literally in five minutes, she can tell you, this kid's going to be a problem. The teacher's standing in the wrong place. It's because she's seen it. She can pattern match. That's what you want. But your great advisors are not going to be able to do something for you or tell you what to do. What they're going to do is they're going to, when you are running forward and you're about to go into some, they're going, whoa, 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 pull you back. Pay attention to this, right? So really, really deep expertise, but seen a lot of situations. The other characteristic of advisors that I've seen that, that are just really helpful are there are people who have really cultivated the art of advising. And I've had, you know, I talked about this board member who's just an expert at sales. I have another advisor who's a, who's a technology advisor. And he's never managed, he'd be a terrible technology manager, he's actually never been a VP of engineering, anything like that. But somehow he has just perfected this art of giving advice, of understanding, like, you should look at this, you should be cautious about that. And doing it in a way that kind of points out where you, should, where you really can look, right? There are people out there who are completely expert at the art of advising. Those are the people that you want. And when you have an interaction with those people, you have to package the interaction so that you're focused on something material about your business. And you'll tell because you will have moments. Every single time I talk to these people, there's, there's somebody that we work with also on the product side. Every time I talk to them, I go, I have palm to forehead, I go, you're right. I should do that, or I should look at that. 
I don't know how to solve that, but I must solve that, right? So um, advisors are all about your ability to set up, pick the right people and set up the right situation. The question is how many can you do that and create a nutritious experience? So I'll give you an example of um, an advisor situation that, that uh, is a little counterintuitive. So it turns out that my company, we do data science, we do software analytics, and I happen to personally know two people in computer science who won the MacArthur Genius Grant in computer science for data analytics on language. I just, I, I'm, I just happen to know them through kind of social and academic circles, and they actually kind of know each other. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, and they're really, really nice people. So I think this is, this is going to be great. They're MacArthur geniuses. They are professors at Berkeley and Stanford. They're kind of friendly with each other. This is going to be awesome. And, um, and they are. They're so smart, and we have a conversation. But the, it turns out that what they're working on is not the biggest problem in my company. So I just did, I and my top executives did not have the bandwidth to package up our questions and our issues in a way that they could actually change the trajectory of the company. So even though we could like have lunch and have a great time and have coffee and things like that, you know, they turned out to be advisors that didn't really move the needle for us. And because of that, you know, it's not that nutritious for them either, right? So you know, after having a couple of very fascinating coffees with them, I thought, you know, you know what, I'm going to keep my powder dry and I'm going to save these guys for a later time when they can really move the needle. Now, they're very, very tempting advisors because they're like the vanity advisors, right? I would love to go to my board of directors and go, oh, look, you know, I signed up these two guys. Let's give them some stock options. They're my advisors. But the honest truth is I could not create a mutually nutritious experience where they could, where they could affect the business, right? So that's about advisors. The second thing is consultants. I'm spending a lot of time on this because I do think that these out-of-core resources are going to be the key to kind of building your resources for building your company. Consultants. So consultants um, are expensive. They have to be expensive in order to you know, earn a living around here, right? So how can you engage consultants? Well, again, you have to work to create a nutritious experience. So I'll give you an example. Um, when we started building our iPad and phone and mobile apps about three years ago, so we are fantastic, all this back-end rocket science software and these enterprise delivery systems, and we were like, hey, everybody's going mobile. We've got to have these rich and creamy mobile apps. Oh my gosh, you know, let's start hiring mobile, mobile people. And then I thought, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I can hire mobile people, but you know, how exciting is it going to be to be a, like a mobile person in a company that's just all about data analytics and backend algorithms and things like that? So I decided to go out and find the best mobile consultants. I wanted people who were spending their time developing consumer apps, developing games, who were on the bleeding, bleeding edge, who were spending most of their time thinking about this away from my company so they could inject that DNA into my company. So consultants are great because you can find somebody who's spending their time honing their craft in the larger market that can inject that into your company. Now we found these consultants, and I really wanted to hire them. It happened that they were some of the top mobile contract developers in Silicon Valley, which means that they were doing things like building the mobile app for Zappos. Okay, so now why would they, you know, so, and that's like four, four or five, again, guys. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, each one of them could have been a software architect in, you know, in, in, in any large software company. They were great. And so again, what we had to do was to put together a really compelling experience for them. So it wasn't enough to say, oh, you know, we have this need, right? So we had to put together a compelling experience. Why do you want to work on our stuff? Well, you want to work on our stuff because we are, you will be surfacing the information experience around this incredible data analytics, this incredible kind of business MRI machine. We have all the back end. You will surface it into a mobile business experience, right? And because we actually packaged up a great experience, because I have a fantastic technical team, we spent a lot of time, we actually really cultivated and romanced these consultants. And we actually did not pay them as much as everybody else paid them. And they worked for us, and they still work for us, right? Uh, and so you can get the top consultants, but you have to sell them, right? They may be selling services but you also have to sell them on what this is going to do to move the needle for them. Interim experts. 
Uh, this has been another great source of resources for us. <clears throat> a lot of times you have people that are very expert in the industry, but the industry is changing, right? So they have this expertise. I know a consultant, she is a total expert at negotiating partnership contracts. The best, like incredible. Had never worked in SaaS, you know, software as a service um, kind of business models. And so we approached her and we said, hey, you know, we know you have much, much bigger clients, right? Um, but the world is going SaaS, so work with us and this is your opportunity to understand our SaaS business model while you inject your expertise about negotiating partnership contracts, right? So there are a lot of times when you find somebody, maybe they are a mobile expert and they've been in an engineering team and they want to move to be a product manager, right? And, they're, and you can give them, you can be their stepping stone, right? So that's the other thing to look for is people who have tremendous expertise in the domain where you can be their crossover to the next step that they want to take. And then interns. We've had incredible success with interns. Um, we're very lucky here. We are surrounded by great schools. Of course, there's Stanford and Berkeley, but there's also Santa Clara U University. There's you know, uh, UCSF and USF. There's Davis. There's Santa Cruz. Um, tremendously great experience with interns. But again, in order to make the interns uh, really, really productive for us, we actually <clears throat> devoted somebody to putting together an internship program. So the, the interns came in, we actually knew how many interns we wanted and exactly what we wanted them to produce, and we were prepared to manage them to, to produce that. And in fact, we've actually hired a couple of our top interns. It was amazing. We had star-studded cast of interns from like the best schools, and we picked from our star-studded cast two to hire. And the interns who came to us said that they all had classmates who were like at other companies who were doing things like getting coffee and you know picking up snacks and things like that. Or like just you know running software tests, right? And so what happened is that they had a great experience, they told their classmates, and it's a snowball effect. All of these are about there are tremendous resources in the Bay Area. The the gating factor is not going to be the resources you're surrounded with, right? It's going to be your capacity, how much of your personal energy budget do you have to create a nutritious experience. And so, you know, I would say that as you, as you meet people, keep that in mind. Think about how would you actually organically form, you know, ish, things that you have to get done into bite-sized digestible pieces so that other people can kind of latch on, engage with that, and help you metabolize that, right? So, capacity versus leadership. This is something that um, you know a lot of a lot of uh, early stage companies will have, struggle with, right? There's just a need to just do stuff. Just have the capacity to do stuff. Have the capacity to pick up the phone and call, you know, X number of customers to interview your users or your consumers to write to just write the website, write the marketing materials. And then there's the need to like pull back and look at the big picture. And especially in the early days, you personally are going to be going back and forth and back and forth between this. And ideally, if you have a co-founding team that you can put together that can also make this transition, you're in great, you're in great shape. But what you will find is that you will sometimes have to devote you know, a lot of time to capacity and then maybe somebody else can take the leadership. So, so Penny, again, the CEO and I, we have this partnership where we've both been, you know, kind of leader, um, uh, leader experts, right? We both do functional jobs, and you know, we lead the different functions of the company throughout the, the different stages of the company. And we, we actually talk to each other a lot about this this uh, experience that we have of like having the bends, right? It's like. It's like when you know when you're when you're scuba diving, you go down and you have to come up too fast, right? And so you have to actually be aware that you're constantly having to make this trade-off, and when you need to sit in one position or the other. And you know, one of the interesting things about being in a startup is that when you look at people who have a lot of experience in established large companies, a lot of them are very very well trained in expertise of doing something. Some of them are very well trained in, in leadership. But the real name of the game in a startup are people who are artisanal. 
right? A startup is fundamentally artisanal. The people who are successful at startups, whether they are your marketing staff or your software people, even on our stage, which is the you know more of the high growth stage, I am st I'm, I'm beginning to hire some people that are just more leader types or more capacity types, but I'm still really looking for those those artisanal people, those people who can make the whole chair, right? Who have a vision for how the chair is going to look, who understand exactly what's going to make the difference between execution between a good chair and a bad chair, not waiting, no, not doing it, and then handing it to the other person down the line. Fundamentally, <coughs> making your startup is an artisanal experience. It's about putting together the team. And it doesn't mean that it's all senior people. Sometimes you'll get people who are a couple of years out who really have that, that inclination, right? And sometimes you have people who are like really, really experienced, who may have been doing one job or another, who really have like the whole picture. And it's not the whole picture of the company, it's maybe it's all around marketing. You know, they have all of the you know, all of the aspects of it, right? They love doing it, they love thinking about it, they understand the philosophies, they read the blogs, they network about it. They are real experts in the whole thing. And this artisanal capability, if you can build a startup team of a small a handful of people surrounded by some other external resources that cover the bases of the functions that you need to do. And they can really, you know, they can build the chair in their function, right? You will have the ingredients to get something off the ground. Now, one of the challenges of that is that as you do that, your company is going to be successful. And your company is going to scale. And so what happens as you go from the pure startup to the scaling up phase is that sometimes these people who are artisanal are not the classic people to build teams, right? They're not the classic people to put together the process that's going to work for 10 people because they've been doing it themselves, right? So one, one of the other things I just wanted to talk about quickly was because everybody here has kind of a founder mentality, you know, let's assume success and your company goes into a high growth stage. Um, what is a winning game plan for founders? And you know, I, I talk about this because the statistics for founders staying in successful companies is actually dismal. It's pretty bad. Uh, does anybody have the statistics? It's it, close to zero, but it's not very. It's not, it's, not, it's not close to zero, but it's not. Okay. It's not like eighty percent. Oh no. It's not like eighty percent. And you know, and we hold up the founder CEOs. You know, the Jeff Bezos or the these are all guys, guys right? Yeah. Elon Musk. Uh, you know, th those guys, right? But they are the exception. The reason that they're, the, everybody shines a light on them is because they're the exception. And the reason that founder longevity in successful startups, I'm not talking about unsuccessful startups, let's assume success, is actually, is actually not so great, is because the characteristic of a founder is a very special characteristic, right? Founders create this reality distortion field. They create something out of nothing. So, what is the game plan for founders? Your company is incredibly successful. Your company has been nothing. If it's, it's incredibly successful, it means it's going to be a multi-million dollar company. From nothing to a multi-million dollar company, that is a huge rate of growth, right? So successful founders I have seen think about, constantly they think about what, they, they think about what are the problems that are happening in my company that nobody else can solve because founders have a very special position. You can touch things that are the third rail. You can work on things that are so ambiguous that nobody else can articulate the problem. The successful founders that are really accelerating their, their growth stage companies, when they've gotten something successfully going, they look around, they go, well, who can take this forward? You know, I solved this problem, who can take that forward, right? And they seriously, seriously reevaluate where they're spending their brain cycles, their time, their emotional energy, like two to three times a year. Um, I do this constantly. The success, and this goes back to trust, right? So if you trust the team that you're working with, if you trust your management team, if you trust the team you're around, you don't worry about doing this. I have somebody on my team, I have a lot of people on my team, some of whom I brought in to run teams because I brought them in, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm at the point, I need you to run this team. And then all of a sudden, something in the company changed. And I needed them to solve another problem. So I said, I don't want you to spend time running anything. You have nobody working for you. Come over here and work on this thing. Don't run a team. 
And then, you know, maybe in the next incarnation, they're going to go and run a different team, right? Uh, it, it's very interesting. One of the um, happiest and most successful founders that I know actually worked in a company that went public. He was a founder. He's a technical founder. He's brilliant. Um, he never took a position above the level of director of engineering. It just wasn't, it wasn't like what he wanted to do. And it was really interesting. So, you know, there were executives that were hired around him and above him. And he worked on a lot of different areas. He ran and built a lot of different engineering teams. But he was always moving lateral and strategic around. Now, when the company went public, he probably made more money than, like, almost anybody in the company. But he didn't even have an executive level title, right? He was incredibly successful. He had an incredibly uh, satisfying and fun ride at the company. Um, there are other people who are, you know, founder CEOs, and it really works out for them. Most of those people are hiring the right executives at different moments in time to actually take over different functions. I think that this is particularly, perhaps, hard for women, because we work so hard to get where we are. I mean. If you go to you know any other startup event you know other than this one or Women 2.0, <laughs> you just look around the room, right? You work so hard to get the thing off the ground. You look, you work so hard to get to the spot that you're at. You know this is your baby, right? And so I think the trick is to figure out how to not get stuck by function or by title. And I'm not telling the story because I want to be discouraging. I think there are a lot of great founder CEOs. But the statistics do not lie. The statistics are very, very cautionary for founders. And when I've seen founders not make it with their company, it's, it's like, it's heartbreaking, right? But what happens is because they got somehow like on a conveyor belt that was like about a particular function, right? So they got on a con conveyor belt and maybe they were like the absolute right person to put the marketing, you know, they had the marketing vision early on. But then, you know, the marketing vision got done, and then it was all about, like, how do you manage a $2 million marketing budget? And then all of a sudden, the company has to evaluate, well, are you the right person? You know, how do you compare to other people in the industry who are managing $2 million? Oh, well, you're not really, oh, yeah, you, you aren't really like those people. Oh, you don't actually, you, you know, and, and, and it's, it's actually true. Maybe in that function, that person doesn't add up, right? But as a founder, that person understands the business deeply, right? So. The, the situations that I've seen where the founders are, for some reason, it, it gets to a point where there's not a fit. It's because they've gotten on some conveyor belt that's like stuck by function and title. The incredibly, highly effective founders are the ones who take advantage of their position as founders, who, get, who use that permission to move around the company, right? And who are solving the, the hardest to articulate the, the weirdest problems were reaching out to other people who were kind of pushing the fa fuzzy boundaries of the company. Um, and so um, that's just to say that you have to plan for success. And I know it's really, really hard to picture when you're like sitting there in your room with your bowl of ramen noodles <laughs> thinking, am I going to write code or am I going to call five customers right now? I'm not sure which thing to do. but. Successful, you know, this valley has bred so many successful companies, and what successful companies look like is they grow from nothing to multi-million dollar companies, to multi-tens of million dollar companies, to hundred million dollar valuations, to hundreds of employees. And the thing that I tell everybody that I bring into First Rain at our stage and at earlier stages is we are, you know, we're a we're a reasonably moderately successful company. I'm very, very proud of our success. It's very solid success. And we are doubling to tripling every year, right? And so everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's... But you think about a company that's doubling to tripling every year. At the moment that you get your startup gets traction, it will double to triple every year. You may go through some times when you're plateauing. You may go through some times trying to get off the ground. But as you get traction, that's the rate of change. What this means is eight times entirely different company every six months. You know, what's your interest in that company? What role should you play in that company? What are the problems of that company? What's the right management structure? Every six months, it's basically a different company. So that's the thing that I always try.
try to remember. And, and, and it is so fast, twice a year. It's like a totally, like, you, you know, it's like joining a different company, right? Luckily, you know everybody in the company, and hopefully you have trust, right? So you can move around. Um, so, anyways, I think I've used up my time. And uh, I know you guys are out there, you're getting your stuff off the ground, you're trying to put together the teams, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna get all those things done. Um, if I can be of help, if I can introduce you to people, uh, very, very happy to be in touch. Um, I have a lot of respect for people who, uh, I think it's a really special thing to start something. It is a really special thing to get something off the ground. Um, it is, uh, women are in unbelievably economically underrepresented. And I, and I don't say that just because I'm an advocate for women. I think it makes no economic sense in our markets that women are so underrepresented. I will say that coincidentally, this is not by design, but the, the top three women at first reign, the CEO, myself, the CEO. So the CEO runs the company and personally runs most of the sales, marketing, go to market functions. I'm the COO, I run all of the product technology functions and my GM of my India R&D Center are all technical women. Um, and I've got to say that you're going back to that trust factor, I, and we've had other people in different roles, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's huge. It's huge. So um, feel free to be in touch. Okay. I, have, I have cards here, and I know that you guys are all busy doing your own things, but if you have Colleagues, family members who are looking for jobs. First Rain is a cool company. It's so fun to work at. It really is. I wouldn't be here for seven years if it wasn't, you know, it's not worth it if it's not fun. So I, um, I have, have some one question about that. that I wanted to ask, and then I'll. Yep. That. You had mentioned that it's a restart. <coughs> yes. It's a restart. Yes. You want to talk? Or could you talk about this? Right. Good, good right. So I, I don't know if that's a politically correct term. No, I, I'm okay. using just... plain English here, right? <laughs> And what it means is that um, <clears throat> the company was started by actually a, a really, really talented um, te technology team. And they really were like fresh PhDs out of MIT and Princeton, you know. Uh, I guess people hand sure. tens of millions of dollars to people who haven't held a job before, um, which is fine. Uh, but they built some incredible technology, but there was no like company or business model that was gelling out of it, right? And so at the point where they recruited Penny Hersher, who is the first rank CEO, they recruited her onto the board. Um, and she looked at the company, she thought it was very intriguing. This information science space that we were in, you know, seven years ago was just kind of starting, right? The, the, that description that I gave you was like, that was a little bit imaginary. It's totally real now, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it was, it was kind of this interesting inkling. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then she, talked me into coming, and we really had to kind of financially restructure the company, right? It just hadn't been structured in a, in a way that was savvy, that was structured like a company that could grow in a B2B SaaS model, mm -hmm. doubling to tripling every year, having the right levels of investment, having the right investment structures. So what we did was we actually retained the technology, we retained the core technical team, the managing director of my India R&D Center was at that time an engineering manager who... <laughs> managed five people. I thought she was a pretty talented engineering manager. Her, her stuff was all really, really well run, right? Uh, it was all, always really uh, organized. And, and she was a great example of somebody who, um, you know, she came up through the engineering ranks. And at one point I said, you know, I, I, I need to start this data analytics, this data science team, and I want you to build it for me. And she said, what are you talking about? Like, I have this, I'm a woman, I'm in India, I've like become a director of engineering, you want me to walk away? And I said, trust me. This is, so she built this whole other function for me. She, she was someone who made those lateral moves, right? She's part of the founding team, she made those. I said, you can build this for me. And then she built this other function, so she had run like all my different technical functions. And then, when we needed her managing director, she was the right choice, right? So what we did was we went in and we structured the company in a professional way. So the company had terrific technology, it had some core talent, and what we did was we structured it to be a real high growth Silicon Valley company, and we gave it a go-to-market model, we gave it a business model, we started re-architecting the product to be an enterprise grade product. You know, all that laborious stuff. <laughs> I have a question.
question. Yeah. Penny. Um, you said that you and Penny yes. are both very different people. Yes. So <laughs> how how did you um, how did you find each other, and how did you you know, with each of you being different, how did you know that you'd be a good sort of, there'd be good synergy between yeah. the two of you? You know, it's, it's um, I, I really do hope you meet her someday because we just couldn't, like, we just couldn't be more different. Like, uh, you know, like, you know, we've, we've both been given, like, zillions of personality tests and we're just like, like that, <laughs> right? And, you know, and, and, and we argue with each other and stuff like that. But <laughs> fundamentally, well, so Penny recruited me when I was, like, a tiny peanut before I started my company. I actually left her to start, a com to start that company. So I, I worked for her very early on. And then, you know, I left and I started a company and was, it actually worked, which was pretty good. And then I noticed that, oh, she went and ran a startup and she took it public. And I was like, oh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> and we, then we crossed paths again at another company. Um, and what, what fundamentally makes it work with us is that we are very, very different in our approach, our style, our skills, the way we relate to employees. But we are completely aligned in terms of our values. Like, we both have this, we believe that there is a reason we're doing this. And the reason is, we could both have any variety of jobs, and she could, you know, she's supposed to be, she was supposed to be retired, which she apparently was very bad at. Um, but the reason is because we think that there is a high integrity way to do business. We think that, I believe, that business done well is like a fundamental human transaction, right? I give you something that is a value, you give me something that is a value, we both get something that we value more than what we gave up. That's great business. Whether it's the way companies do business with each other, whether it's the way companies do business with consumers, whether it's the way companies transact with their, with their employees, right? And so we are both at the stage of our careers where we want to build a company that we are totally proud of. And we have complete alignment around that. So we don't have to worry about that much, right? So we have a lot of trust in each other's skills, um, uh, you know, and uh, and I have been in companies where the top two executives don't have that level of alignment. Or they have that level of alignment, but there's a lot of ambition that's in the way. We don't. We, we have a very clear understanding of our personal values, and our personal values actually translate directly into how we run the company. Um, so. So that really, you know, it really is about trust and alignment. It's like motherhood and apple pie, but I can't tell you the difference it makes. When I'm working all night solving some impossible thing that is actually not possible to solve in any good way, it's what keeps me excited. Any other questions? Quite a group. <laughs> okay, well, oh Roger, go ahead. <laughs> Seems like you've had such great experience, and uh, you know you were out raising money, you know, before you had customers. But, but what advice do you give to, you know, uh, folks? I've got a number of clients that are, you know, selling enterprise solutions, and when you're getting the sort of pushback, you know, the sales cycle's too long. Yep. Um, you know how how do you overcome that? Uh, you know. You, you listen and you fix it. <laughs> I mean, is, you, have you, is your sales cycle pretty short? No, wow. sometimes. Yeah. I mean, our, you know, like any enterprise company that's trying to do five-figure deals, going to six-figure deals, going to seven-figure deals, there are absolutely some aspects of our sales cycle and sales metrics that are like, this is exactly right, and then there's other things that are like, okay, you know, this is an area that we still have to work on. Um, in terms of, so, so, so one of the things about, um, about, and, and I did raise money for at the at the company that I started. So I started it, I bootstrapped it, I raised money, I sold it. So I did all of those stages, and and it is um, raising money is just uh, very. It's a very humiliating experience. Um, I don't think. Yeah. Again, maybe a male founder would not. Uh, maybe these men would say it, but I don't see a lot of you know, young, hotshot tech male founders standing up and saying, now either I have a totally different experience than they do, which is, I probably have a little bit of a different experience, probably not totally different, right? Raising money is, is you have to have such, such thick skin. But what I have learned through the process is you hear from people who are seeing lots and lots of companies. 
and there is a lot of value in that. Um, so what we do when we're in a money raising round is that we listen really carefully. We also, you know, are very honest with each other, like, oh my god, it is really hard to sit there and be, you know, the person who's like pulled this together over years and then have somebody take pot shots at your thing, right? Um, but I think you, you have to focus on like, what can you get out of it? Um, and I think that investors, um, they really appreciate, investors and board members really appreciate people who understand their feedback. They really do. You know, sometimes it's just, hey, I understand you're looking for this kind of business model. I have this kind of business model. I totally understand your investment profile. It doesn't line up. I'll let you know if things change, and I'll be very, very genuine about that. Again, that genuine exchange of value, right? If I really, you know, if we really disagree, you know, we'll say, maybe you don't understand. Like, maybe it seems like either I don't understand or you don't understand. Um, but what I find in that process uh, is that um, you're talking to people who just see so many, so many business plans and so many companies, and most of them fail. And so when they give you warning signs, well, you're to this and you're to that, they're real. They're pointing to real patterns. Those patterns may not bite you, but they're pointing to real patterns. That is that is gold. You gotta take that and take it to the bank, and it may give you an upset stomach or you know, make you hold your head. But you gotta take that to the bank. Could I just, um, could you talk for a few minutes about the, the characteristics of the salespeople you look for uh, to sell a product like this? And where I'm coming from is here you have a very, very technical product, right? And yep. you're David and Goliath is GE. Yes. And you not only have to deal with the technical people there, you have to deal with the procurement people. Absolutely. Yeah, you know exactly Absolutely. what I'm talking about. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, thing. let me yeah. just tell you how GE... We sell lots of divisions of GE, but one of the ways that GE uses our product is that Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, has a seven-inch touch screen in his war room. And on that touch screen, he tracks, originally it was his 15 top customers across all of GE, all the divisions of GE, like power and water and capital and turbines, 15, and then it expands to 100 and expands. He uses First Rain as part of a suite of tools to track his top 300 customers across all of GE. It was not like a walk in the park <laughs> to get onto Jeff, the touch screen in Jeff Immelt's war room, right? So it's, it, it's, it's such a great question because um, we have hired, um, we have uh, definitely hired and turned over uh, lots of salespeople and sales teams. Um, it's part of the thing. And one of the things that I've realized, I don't run the go-to-market part of the company in this company. But one of the things that I've been, so I have the benefit of just observing, <laughs> because I don't actually have to solve it, um, is that sales, salespeople from our stage of technology and product, <coughs> they're actually not, the pe they're, they're not necessarily just the deal makers. They're people who are consultative. They're people who love to talk about, um, so for example, one of my hiring criteria for field technical people and for salespeople, and for some of my product people are, is this likely to be somebody who will, on their own, read the Harvard Business Review, The Economist, or The Wall Street Journal? Like, are they really interested in business for our product? Because they're gonna sit down with the person who's the chief of staff of the CEO of GE, and they're gonna talk to that person about their business, and we're gonna have this like crazy rocket science technology platform but what they have to engage is they have to have an interesting business conversation and say, you know what, we can help you guys see through the markets and see the intersections between your top customers' businesses and your businesses, right? They have to have that business conversation. So the right sales and, and field people for our stage of company are the ones who are actually fascinated by business and who can have that really smart business conversation. So they're, they're, much, they're much more consultative. Now you also have to have sales, now we've had salespeople that are really, really consultative, but they can't close, so they also have to close. Um, we won't close. But, uh, yes, exactly. But, you know, that's really, like, and, 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 and I will be very honest, we definitely went through phases where we were like, oh my gosh, we hired people who were successful. Like, we're like, this person made President's Club every single year, 
and they are not successful here. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's because they just they didn't have that fascination with the conversation. And when you're creating a new category, when you're trying to do reality distortion, when you're creating something out of nothing, you have to personally just have that inclination. And, and so that really is a, it's really a criteria that I use when I'm interviewing people. I go, you know, is this person likely to just be interested in reading the Wall Street Journal? You know, whether they do or not, like, would they be interested in that? Like, if, does that fascinate them? No, that's a very interesting <clears throat> way you put it, because the temptation, it seems, for, for a lot of companies first starting out in the technical fields is they believe their salespeople have to be expert technicians in what they sell. Yeah, yeah. Not, not for us. Right. Yeah, th they can always like bring me in and you know pull the string and I'll <laughs> say all the algorithm words, right? Yes. So that's <laughs> that's easy. What I can't do is get the person to return right. my phone call, spend the time at the table, trust us, even consider doing a six-figure deal, a seven-figure right. deal with a company that they've never heard of. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> um, have you um, seen um, important differences between uh, B2B startups versus B2C startups that we should be aware of? Oh, huge, huge differences, right? So, <clears throat> totally, um, well, totally different business model, totally different way of valuing your business. The investment community looks at these businesses. Um, you know, told, so, so you were saying, it sounds like you work with some B2B startups. Yeah, so in, in B2B startups, um, the investment community has gotten incredibly savvy about sales models, business models. Um, they've got their finger on the metrics that they think are going to predict linear growth versus exponential growth, right? And, um, and, there are some, and there are these really funny derivative internal metrics. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and it's all about, like, it's all about sales efficiency and it's all about how fast you can convert um, how fast you know, how, how fast does it think that you can get a salesperson up to speed and really selling and things like that so my observation is that you know they're, they're, that's the that they're a whole different set of metrics around b2b um, in b2c it's really all about turf and expansion right it's really about can you actually get user traction and I think that uh, again um, the investment community and the business community are getting much more savvy about what real traction is. You know, it's not like number of people who just signed up by saying use Facebook to log in, but it's actual engagement numbers um, and things like that. And um, the kinds of teams that it takes. So, for example, we, we've had a very strong technology team. We've built a really strong B2B team. I've started actually injecting some um, B2C people into my team. Uh, but they have to kind of learn about what the business result is that we're, that we're trying to achieve. Um, so they tend to be very, very different pedigrees, um, and they're not necessarily um, transferable. I think you have to be very deliberate about placing one to the other. So I recently built a whole UX and product team that is actually um, led by somebody who uh, ran the UX at Progressive Insurance. And, you know, that whole, like, uh, bid your own insurance uh, price that like, she designed that whole interaction um, because uh, I really felt that in the enterprise B2B space we need an injection of that DNA but we needed to have an incredibly well structured um, foundation <coughs> excuse me foundation for her to land into right uh, a so B2C is more of a land grab <coughs> sort yeah. of like you know, mm -hmm. show show user traction and show user engagement, yeah. like beyond vanity metrics. Exactly. And then occasionally you have companies like Yammer, right? Yammer, really interesting company. <coughs> so they are a B2B company, and they were, you know, a unicorn acquired for a billion dollars by Microsoft. Mm -hmm. But um, they totally took a B2C play. <coughs> so Yammer at the point where they were acquired, actually had single-digit million-dollar recurring revenues. Very low. <coughs> I apologize. Um, but they had really, really high user counts. <coughs> and that was very risky. Because the question is, like, you've got, so they had all these users, 
but the risk was, were they going to be able to monetize those users, right? Well, and the question is, were they going to be able to get enough users to really blow the lid off the perception, right? So it's like if they had gotten half as many users, which would have been a lot, or a third as many users, which, which would have still been a lot, with no monetization strategy, they would have been in probably deep doo -doo. So I'm kind of in that phase. I, I think I explained a little why there was I was a B2B and I'm, kind of, I'm going to be to see I'm spinning off a portion of a supply chain software into a consumer shopping um, search site. So what I, I've been meeting with investors about a dozen so far. I've you know I'm, I'm not getting I'm not getting a um, disappointed. I've heard you can see a hundred before someone will you know write a check, and I'm getting a lot of. This is a great idea. I love it. Oh my gosh, I want to use the site. Or even one angel investor I went to, he's like, I used it and it worked. I found the part at Palo Alto Bike Shop. It was so cool. But they're not writing checks. They all want to be my advisor. They're like, oh, I could be an advisor and that's not going to be my fund. You got to see traction and they want to see. The, so I say, okay, I need funding to do the consumer campaign, but I know I can get it and here's my plan. I show them the really outlined marketing plan of how it's a targeted market, I know exactly where they are, it's not going to take long for me to get that traction, I'm already getting hits just organically, you know, people are accidentally finding it, right. um, but it'll really happen when I get funding and I can launch this for real, and they say, show me you got revenue, well, I can't charge revenue, they don't want to use the word can't, can't charge revenue until I get that traffic, and so they, uh, they agree, and they just look at you and go, wow, good luck with that, <laughs> and so I'm in that phase of, you, know, like, when you see all these companies getting funded now that are they don't have traction. All these online, you know, so many search and e-commerce sites. And you, you know, I read the um, Silicon Valley Business Journal every day. It's like a million dollars, bazillion dollars, whatever. But I, I don't know how I find that right. You know, target investor to say, yeah, I don't have revenue yet, but I will, and here's how. Right, and I think the question is, um, you know, I, I, I think to, to both of your mm -hmm. questions and to, and to the Yammer thing, which, which I was just so impressed. I, I thought it was a really, I don't know if I'm, I, I just thought it was really interesting. Because what they did was they chose a model and they doubled down and tripled down on it. I mean, they went for the model. They were going to go for numbers and eyeballs and subscribers, and that's what they did. And nobody talked about it, interestingly, at the point of acquisition, but their revenues were in the single digit millions, and they weren't in the high single digit. It was amazing because, and what's amazing about that is not, I, I don't know whether the valuation was worth it. I think Microsoft needed a play there. What was impressive was that the management team picked this strategy, which was so, like, we're going left, and they did it. They did it all the way, right? Um, and, you know, you have other companies like, also in the enterprise SaaS space, I don't know if you're thinking about the consumer side, but like Eloqua, which absolutely went for the revenue play, right? And very, very impressive with actually relatively little investment, um, built a business model, built a business model with all the right metrics, with all the right sales productivity very, very quickly, and also had a, I believe, north of half, you know, half a billion dollar um, acquisition. So they picked, you know, this other thing, and, and Alec was actually, um, didn't have that many subscribers, right? So, so they just, so, so I think it's about, uh, you'll you'll hear like you'll hear lots and lots of things, and it's about having conviction about which model is actually going to genuinely, with integrity, prove success. Um, and it is scary to commit to one because it's tempting to kind of hedge your bets and do a little bit of the other one, right? Um, I think I'm committed to the model. It's a matter of the curve before the horse. They want to see this, and they're like, well, I can't do it unless I have that. And so yeah, you don't want to say can't, so I'm trying to be creative and figure out where I can get the smaller amounts of funds so I can show even just the tiniest bit of traction. Right. Um, and and, and I, th so. I think the question is, what what will it take to show that the machine runs? Right. right. Because that's what they're looking for, is either they're looking to say, I don't know how the machine runs, but I see the results of the machine. Yeah. So I'll, results, uh, don't understand the machine, but I'll believe that it runs because I see the results. Or you have to be very, um, very strategic about, you know, if I string these four things together and I run it, it is genuinely a demonstration that the machine runs, right, commercially. Yeah, we have that demonstration, but yeah. All right, I'll keep going. Oh, Just got to keep going. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
and raising raising money is uh, sort of mysterious and humbling. Yeah. Some would say humiliating, <laughs> but also learning, like incredible learning. I love every meeting. I love the feedback. Absolutely. Yeah, and just realize that whatever they say, they're telling you about fifty other companies. Like every sentence out of their mouth is insider information about fifty other business plans mm -hmm. they've seen. That is gold. I like said it's gold. Like that, I will take any day. Right. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.